All right, let's do it. So um, today we're talking about um, Terraform workspaces. And, and it's really all about like, you know, re minimizing repeated code. Um, I've seen Terraform implemented in a few different ways in a few different places. And workspaces has been around since I think the .10 release. Um, and it, so it's, you know, it's, it's supposed to be used pretty widely, but I haven't seen it used as often as I think it should be. I think it's a really useful um, piece of Terraform. And it's, if we use it correctly, um, we can really minimize that copy paste approach. Um, a little context, uh, a, little about, a little about me. Um, I'm a cloud service engineer at AHEAD. Uh, we do an awful lot of stuff in the cloud, just generally. Um, go ahead and check them out at, at AHEAD at, uh, on Twitter. I'm going to check my blog out at coin.pw and everywhere else at gabcoin. Um, I have two middle names. And that's for GitLab and GitHub. Um, this is my dog, Turnip. She's incredible. So I had some extra space, so bear with me here. Um, so what we're mostly talking about is these two uh, products. Uh, Terraform, you know, we all are, we know and love Terraform, um, presumably. Um, it's an orchestration tool. It's about as cloud agnostic as you can expect a tool to be, and it's pretty easy to write. And then GitLab is a VCS, a version control system, but it also builds a lot of different features uh, throughout the DevOps tool chain offered from a single platform. And um, it's open core, which is a big piece of, of how and why I moved to it initially. Um, Terraform features the same model. You know, it's, it's open core. The open source offering can get you pretty far. Um, but there's also an enterprise closed source offering on top of that that can um, provide a lot more usability. So a tale as old as time. I mean, this is what we, I've seen an awful lot of, of Terraform um, repos, Terraform directory structure look like. We have the staging, the prod, the mail, a bunch of different you know, folders, directories, and there's just files everywhere, and it gets increasingly difficult to manage. And usually it's kicked off by someone from a laptop, and you know, hopefully they, know, you know, they, they remember to pull down from master before they ran it. Like, you know, it, it can be a little, a uh, little hairy. And I mean, this is basically the modern equivalent of a little bit of this action, um, yield server sprawl. Um, and it, as we add more and more resources, more and more servers, more and more cables, more and more directories, more and more Terraform files, it gets a lot harder to manage. And, you know, for a, an ops team to stay agile and to be able to, you know, accommodate the needs of the developers and everybody else, you know, it's important to know and be able to manage it effectively. Um, so Terraform Workspaces, um, basically it, it's the renaming of a state file at, at, at its simplest, which when I first read about it, I wasn't entirely sure about why this was relevant or, or very helpful and I skipped it. Um, and I ended up with a directory structure as was basically previously uh, illustrated. I think that may have been mine actually. Um, and it, only a few um, backends support that. And it's most of the, the bigger ones, honestly, the Azure, Console, GCS, Local, I don't know what Manta is, and S3. Um, and I'll be working with the S3 backend today, and, and this is an example of kind of what it looks like. So I set the, um, the S3 key as AWS slash gloom.tf state, um, but what the workspaces does is it will rename it with this kind of syntax. So env slash, um, this is an interpolation uh, syntax that we're gonna use later on. Um, so be the same kind of things. So whatever my workspace name is going to be would be smashed in there uh, slash AWS slash gloom.tf state. Uh, but it's predictable. It'll rename it the same way every time as one would hope. Um, so what, what, is, what does that mean for us? You know, it gets us a couple things. And the first thing is it gets us that little interpolation syntax I showed you guys before. Um, and th that can be used in a number of different ways. I'm going to go through some of that stuff. Um, and another example is, is that because we know how it's renaming, um, then we can predictably access that state file as a remote data source as necessary down the line. Now, earlier on in my Terraform experience, you know, I wanted to figure out a way to, you know, to you know, have multiple state files, basically. You know, how do I, because we can't interpolate or we can't add variables inside of the actual backend block, that's one of the, you know, I think the only block that doesn't allow interpolation. I'm not sure if dot 12 is doing something with that. I can't remember. Um, but this basically provides a functionality that, you know, it allows us to kind of work around that in a non-hacky fashion. So some examples. So for instance, right here, we have 
um, we can use it as an assume role. Um, so let's say we have you know a prod station at that environment, and each one of those has a different assume role because they're actually separate AWS accounts or separate cloud accounts of any kind. Um, we give you know we have one master account that's going to have the IAM permissions to allow a user or credentials set of credentials to assume a role into a different account, and we're able to look those up using this kind of mapping, um, which is really really helpful because you know that removes that human interaction of uh, I one time or a while uh, we used to run a, an assume role script and get an STS token from AWS uh, on your local machine and then run Terraform from there and just kind of be careful. Now, and this allows if you were to use that, let's say for you know, uh, an uh, automation tool, you'd be able to kick that off without having any kind of human intervention at all. Or even from our laptops, we can just you know, make sure we're in the right workspace um, and it'll automatically handle the rest of that for us. Another example here, um, is that remote state example that I mentioned earlier. So because we can predictably um, you know, know where to find this, and each of these, these files in mirror name differently, we can access the remote state of each environment uh, as needed by each environment. So let's say we have a VPC created by a different set of Terraform files, configs, um, and we have lots of resources down the line or some modules on the line to you know, ingest those. Um, we can automatically uh, just by having that interpolation there, have those uh, remain, um, you know, separated by, by production environment, by environment. Moving on to, to GitLab, all right? So GitLab um, CI is, is kind of interesting. It's, you know, I've, I've tooled around with a number of automation tools over the years, and I, I really like the way that um, GitLab CI is, is written in, de, in, de, in a nice declarative fashion. Um, it's similar to a lot of other CI tools, Travis, uh, Circle, um, but it's incorporated in the Verge control system. And that I, I really appreciated because it was a one-stop shop. I found it pretty easy to use and that open core kind of led me to it. And uh, after I switched over to GitLab from GitHub, I never really looked back. Um, kind of a fan. But tie it all together, let's get into it. Um, yeah, right here. This is good. Blow this up a little bit. Um, so right here is a little demo repo that I made just for you guys. Um, and so we are going to be, um, you know, a little fixed typo action right there. We're going to be deploying this, um, using the GitLab CI. Now it all comes from right here. And again, we're going to see that interpolation syntax used. So before anything else really even happens, we have this commit slug is going to be set to the workspace name. I have this little action right here because I don't like changing the main uh, branch to anything but master. So if it's on master, it's going to prod. Um, and then right here, we're going to set the, the workspace name to the commit slug. And, um, or really we're not, this is where that happens. This is where we, we create the workspace uh, and or select the workspace. And that'll handle all, basically all the rest of the interpolation for us, just from that little action. So if, depending on what branch I'm on, for, you know, clearly it's going to be you know, running uh, you know, whether it's prod or stage or dev. And as such, it's, it allows a, you know, a lot of removal of human interaction. So right here, we're going to kick this job off. Go to my pipelines. I'm going to run this pipeline. I have no variables to pass in. It's on master. Watch this run here. Just a couple steps I got going on. I got validate. Some of the guys earlier in the day talked about some of the other tools available for um, you know, linting or testing. And there's some, some pretty cool ones that were mentioned, TF lint. Um, here we're just running Terraform validate, pretty simple. Um, I know Anton Babenko was on earlier today and he did some really good work with uh, Terraform pre-commit hooks, um, one of which I'm a very big fan of. It will actually take your variables and your outputs and append those to your readme file, which, you know, anything that saves some documentation, I'm all for. So we, we validated, we look good. We're gonna go to our plan step. And, you know, if this was not just me running this, you know, we, we'd have a protected branch. This would, the last step would be manual intervention. Somebody would have to approve it. We'd look at the plan file. Um, you know, this is a, for a very small team, this is a, a decent approach um, to, to some kind of CD for Terraform. Um, now, if we get into larger teams or, you know, a lot of infrastructure changing frequently, Terraform Enterprise is pretty much the, the 
only logical solution to manage that that kind of team size and that kind of infrastructure size. Um, but this gets us, you know, a little way there. So um, all resources are being created. This is uh, an ECS uh, application. Um, we have an awful lot of stuff happening. Got 19 to add. And then right here, what's happening um, is we're going to output to a plan file. That artifact is going to be passed to the next job. And that job requires a manual action. We're going to trigger that, kick it off. And so we're using the HashiCorp Terraform Lite image for this as well. Um, I know some CI tools, you're kind of stuck with, um, you know, they'll, they'll use the same kind of image over and over. I think one uses Ubuntu. Um, of course, you can do Docker and Docker, but uh, it's pretty flexible for how we can pull images down. And, you know, again, we get the, the nice Dockeriness of everything's up to date. We're pulling this straight from Hashi. Now everything's gonna, gonna deploy. It's gonna take a little bit. There's a lot going on there. Online time. Wow. Oh yeah, we started early too though. Um, and so we see, you know, general Terraform stuff's being applied, stuff's being created. Um, and then we'll dig through some of the Terraform code a little bit too while this is all happening. And so this is this is basically all there is to it. Um, it's we have a, this is called a module. The module does all the rest of that heavy lifting. Um, you know, and just set, set the normal stuff up. Um, we can see this being used here too. We have our account, so you know this is only being created if the workspace is prod, which is me a blocker because of um, dependencies right here. So if I forgot to change, you know, my workspace from if I'm running this locally for testing, you know, that'll block me. Or if I'm um, if I'm just committing my code on some some other branch, you know, uh, this isn't going to run. But that'll be mostly handled in the in GitLab CI. We have nice little checks like. Um, only refs, for instance, which would um, basically says that don't run this unless we're on master. Um, and then here's that nice pre-commit. I mean, this is, I don't know if everybody's using pre-commit, but it sure is handy um, for formatting, for documents, documentation and stuff. And um, again, shout out to Anton Babenko for that. So this will actually, I, I run that pre-commit hook and, and this will all kind of drop in there. And he was uh, not familiar. You can go back here to still creating. Um, some considerations for CI tools that uh, kind of mind for me at least when I'm, when I'm you know, picking tooling or, or building something out is, you know, I don't want to reinvent the wheel every time. You know, a lot, in 2019, a lot of these tools are really mature. Um, they've been vetted, people have been contributing for a long time. Um, so I'm looking for, for, you know, something I don't have to reinvent, roll my own. Um, I found a lot of that functionality here. Um, there's other features with GitLab CI, I and mean, I don't work for GitLab, I just like it. Um, such as, you know, container registry. We have, uh, they have their own, like, error tracking. Well, GitLab, GitHub does too, but they have uh, also, like, project management and some Kanban type stuff. Um, and, uh, and an on-prem uh, enterprise feature or just, a, you know, paid SaaS either way. Um, oh, and we're still going there. End product is going to be some point in time a nice little web app type thing. I um, think that's most of what I wanted to cover. Um, it's pretty simple stuff at the end of the day. Like, this is not like reinventing the wheel of any stretch of the imagination. It's just, it's something that, it's a, it's a simple feature that I believe is underutilized. And, um, and when appropriately applied, can really, um, push the, I don't know, it, it reduces the repeated code, you know, it keeps it, do not repeat yourself, that dry approach to, to, to code of, um, you know, we want to make sure that, that there's less opportunity for fat fingering, less opportunity for, for cruft, less opportunity for things to, to linger or for our production staging and development environments to be, you know, completely disparate. Um, and that's finished. And we got ourselves a little game, which is actually quite hard, but you know, there, that's all I got. Any questions?
Thanks, George. I don't know how long that was. It felt like I went really fast when, when I started. <laughs> that was about 15 minutes. Man. So there is a question. It says, could you speak a little bit about what advantages you gain by using workspaces and interpolating based on workspace over just wrapping your Terraform invocation in a bash script or using environment variables to achieve the same effect? Um, in the Q&A panel, in case you need to review it, it's a bit of a mouthful. I'm not sure where to find that, but I can answer that. I mean, um, I mean, wrapping in a bash script, I mean, this, this happens on the, on the state side. I mean, if we were to, to wrap it and, and uh, I guess it would be the same idea if you were to like said the, the uh, backend um, piece, the, the, the backend string, um, you could achieve kind of the same effect, but it's not necessary. We can skip that whole piece and just run it off of Terraform um, first and foremost. And the other piece there is that um, it's extra steps. You know, if we were, we, we can reliably un like assume that the Terraform.workspace interpolation uh, syntax variable um, is going to have the name of the workspace in it. Um, that doesn't, we don't have to set an environment variable, have to get fancy with it. it we can just, and, and that also allows us to create, like, let's say we're using modules or writing a module that was going to have the same kind of interpolation syntax, um, because that will be proliferated throughout your workspace. Um, we can, you don't have to rely on, and if we were building one for the community too, the open source module, we don't have to rely on, on those pe those, uh, the people consuming it to adapt the same approach to their Terraform code. And I think I have, Pull this up. So this is the actual module that I'm I'm calling. And so you can see right here. And this is this is on my my GitLab. It's uh, public, so you guys can check it out. Um, and it's just a demo, ECS demo. But you can see right here. I have Terraform dot workspace. Terraform dot workspace. We have that for like some naming conventions. This is my prod twenty forty eight. Um, have like my uh, environment some tagging, um, more naming stuff. Um, and the more we get custom with it, you know, as I mentioned at the end of that there, the more we get custom with it, the diff more difficult it is for other people to consume it. And um, it's like the same kind of thing as like, you know, coming into a, a new job and somebody's been writing code in a, you know, in a cave by themselves for the last 10 years and you take a look at it and you're like, I don't even know what I'm reading right now. It's difficult, right? So we try to make this as readable and re repeatable and reusable as possible. That's my answer. Thank you.